authenticity matters, diversity in young adult literature. Um, to start, we've, I'd like to get everybody introduce themselves and why you wanted to be on the panel. Um, my name is Lily. Um, I'm part of Lilia's staff, and I am very happy to be on the panel. But I'm on the panel because Alexis is like, would you like to be on the diversity panel? And I'm like, well, duh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's hear some more qualified voices. <laughs> uh, hi, guys. I'm Susan Denner, and I wrote some books. And um, I'm on this panel because I feel that I have a lot to learn. So I wanted to come here and learn. Maybe I should have sat in the audience for that, but I also <laughs> felt like I could be that voice who asks the questions that maybe other people are doing now, so, yeah. Hi, I'm Rashmi Chakshi. I'm the author of A Star Touch Queen. It draws on a lot of Hindu mythology, and um, my dad's Indian, so it was a big impact on my childhood. But I'll be more eloquent later. Getting a lot of I know. <laughs> Uh, my name is Tal Lee. I'm an agent at the Nitro Agency. I'm actually Moshni's agent. Uh, and I love diversity, especially in the YA and children's fiction. So I'm here to scout some new talent. Yes. Here to profiteer. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mark Machero. I go by Mark to stuff online. I run the blogs Mark Reads and Mark Watches. Um, I uh, have a joke where if I'm at a convention, I'm on a diversity panel, that's just sort of how it goes. But I do this a lot. Uh, I teach uh, conventions, which, who are usually, by the way, way more white and male than this, so it's so refreshing to be here, because I just never see this in the audience ever. It's great, it's awesome. Um, and I just finished my first um, uh, book, and it's done, and I am looking for agents. Woo! Oh my god. <laughs> But there's, uh, and I'll talk more about that because a lot of what I know, a lot of what I wrote into it is is what I never saw growing up and what I wanted as a book when I was a teenager. So I wrote that book for myself. I love that. Um, my name is Axie O. Um, I have a debut novel coming out fall 2017. Woo! Um, it's set in futuristic Korea, and I'm Korean American, mm. so it was really fun to write. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, me too. I'm Janella Angelus. I'm a white fantasy writer rather by Tally of this introduction. I signed a few months ago, so I'm here because I feel like I also have a lot to learn, but I want to say. Okay, well, I think I'll start us off with a question that's asked a lot on diversity panels, but I think for good reason. What was the first book that you truly felt you saw yourself in? Yeah, don't go down the line. I'll just jump in, please. I'll jump in. Um, so I read a lot of science fiction growing up. Not that much fantasy because I wasn't into white dudes as wizards. Um, and, um, uh, it wasn't until I was a freshman in high school, and it's my favorite book of all time, uh, The House on Mango Street by Sandra Cisneros. Uh, I'm Latino, and we just don't exist in fiction. Um, in the high school setting and in junior high, I never once saw a single brown person growing up in any of the books that I read. And that was the first, and I mean, it made me cry because it didn't, it was one of those moments where I realized that I am allowed to be in books. I read so many books from the perspective of one type of character that it was, it was almost shocking. I thought it was, I thought it was a practical joke that like, this is not a book that we normally get to read. So I'm very thankful that uh, I got to read that um, when I was like 14 years old. Story, yeah. It's an awesome book. It's like 120 <laughs> pages. Go read it. Um, I think one of the first books that I read that I was really just had that similar like moment like you can do this was Lloyd Alexander's The Iron Ring. Love. <laughs> <laughs> this facial expression. That book was phenomenal. I mean, it is phenomenal. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. And even though Lloyd Alexander is a white guy, I thought that. He addressed a lot of the myths that I had learned growing up from my grandmother very respectfully. Um, and there was this amount of magic that kind of made me feel like he believed it. And I love the female character in the Iron Ring. She was sassy, her name was Mira, and she was dark-skinned. And it was like this beauty that you don't even see championed in Bollywood. You don't see it in, in a lot of stuff. And it was just so refreshing and magical to read. And it was the first time that I ever saw 
saw anyone like myself or like the people that I loved being the heroes and the heroines and having magic and it was just it was wonderful. I've never forgotten that experience. I loved it. I was like I was fourteen. Yeah, wow, it's, it's a magic age. age. <laughs> Anyone else? Um, I rem I can't think of the first book that I truly remember seeing myself in. But I did have a dare with myself one summer to read a hundred books, and I didn't even join one of those reading challenges that they do. <laughs> I could have got so many free pizzas. I know. I just, I <laughs> so I'm sure it was one of those. But I remember the first book that like truly made me want to write diversely was when I read The Hunger Games, and I was talking to a friend, and I was like, I really like the rule looks just like me, and she goes, No, she doesn't. <laughs> and, and I'm like. Really? Did we read the same book? But like I accepted like her opinion. But then when the movie came out and everybody was so angry that Rue and Fresh were black, I was like, it was super obvious in the books. Mm -hmm. I guess I guess I need to make it more obvious. <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe we, that should segue into a new question of what book, if not the book that you mentioned, was the book that inspired you to write diversity? <coughs> This sounds terrible, but like I never even thought about it. So in my first series, I have in the main there's the main <coughs> heroine who joins up with this team called the Spirit Hunters, and there's an Asian American, she's Chinese, and they're all immigrants. So that just made sense, right? It's 1876. It was a world of immigrants, so mm -hmm. that was like the obvious choice, and it never occurred to me. Um, and actually, in hindsight, I'm like, man, I hope I handled it right because I I I did it just because that's what the story asked for, and now I'm realizing more and more as a writer, like, you know, you don't want to offend people or get it wrong, and like, obviously, you can look at me. My story is very different from your, your story, and so, um, if you guys read it, let me know. That's how it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I did my best, and, but I, I could do better, I think. Um, and so, yeah, and the truth would you the fantasy world, so I was able to like really, really go and have fun. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess there's less books, but a lot of manga and anime oh, actually yeah. made it seem like, oh, well, obviously the Asian is the heroine, because she's like, <laughs> 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 it's not Serena, she's the savvy. <laughs> um, so in that way, when I started writing, I was always like, it, like, it was like fan fiction from like anime. <laughs> so it became, it was natural to do an Asian protagonist, because that's what I grew up on. But also a book that I really loved, what is called Dragon Sword and Wind Child by uh, Mariko Ogiwara. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice, so happy! <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. It's, like a, it's, a, it's a Japanese book that was translated to English, so you can read it. <laughs> and it's, it's just, it's a beautiful, um, it has, it's based on Japanese culture, even though the fantasy is like a fantasy Japan. And it's just, it's beautiful. <laughs> just read it. The cover's beautiful. <laughs> People might laugh at me for this answer, but it's not necessarily a book that had me, made me feel seen, but in 2006 when High School Musical came out, <laughs> uh, I was very moved that Gabrielle was played, uh, Vanessa Hudgens is a Filipina. Um, that was the first time I'd ever actually seen someone who looked like me. and. I went to a high school that was an all-girls private Catholic school, and we had all these musicals. And I couldn't necessarily go up for the leads because they were all, you know, they didn't look like me. And so I always thought, oh my gosh, I can be Gabriella. Um, and so having that revelation was what made me want to write diversely because if I can't see myself, I want to put myself out there. Um, I want to make myself more visible um, so that, you know, you know, young Filipino girls don't need to wait until they're age 13 to see themselves. Are you familiar with Brandy's Cinderella? Yes! yes. I read for the first time as a high school freshman, uh, and that resonated with me so much because everything these girls did was so relatable, especially the overbearing Asian mother. <laughs> 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 I was like crying 
was like, this is so real. <laughs> appearing in my own work, uh, Octavia Butler was probably the biggest oh, influence yes. on my own work. Um, if you've not read Octavia Butler, she wrote the best book in every genre, and then never wrote in that genre again. <laughs> she wrote the best time travel book you will ever read. She wrote the best book about vampires in the history of the universe. It's called Fledgling, you're welcome. Uh, she did Alien uh, Invasion, oh man, it's, and the thing that I like about her words, her worlds is that they are naturally diverse without seeming like they're checking off boxes on a list. It's that she's, she makes all of them hyper real, and that was something that I wanted to have in my own work, where it never felt like I'm going out of my way to include people. I'm instead writing the world as it is, and then just adding messed up things on top of it. Um, so yeah, Octavia Butler is a huge influence on me. Okay, then I think time allows us to Talking about books that we really, really love, why don't we segue that back into how our books are diverse and like the intersection between diversity in our books and in our lives. Um, I know in my book, um, there is like this massive plague that takes away an ability that most people have. I have to be super vague about this because it's really high concept if I say it out loud. And I have this terrible fear of saying it But anyways, um, I originally went into the idea of being with disability is a cruel, terrible thing. But the more I got into it, the more I realized that they, people without this unique ability could still live life completely fully. And it wasn't like they were, that they were living a lesser life. And so the people who were against that idea, it, was, it sort of became like a savior. Like you're less than, um, which is a problem in like disability in um, diverse. So it's something I'm really excited to explore in my story. But now I want to hear about yours. <laughs> um, so with the Star Touch Queen, it is my love letter to fairy tales. And when I was growing up, my mom is Filipino, my dad is Indian, and they didn't teach us our native, their native languages. They didn't want us to get confused because we were first generation American. And you know, my dad had been bullied a lot when he moved here and had like an Indian accent and all that kind of thing, so he didn't want that for us. Um, and for me, my, my bridge back to my parents' heritage and my heritage was fairy tales and world mythology. And the more and more that I read, the more I just saw that we were just telling the same story over and over again. That same story, you could find it across the cultural spectrum. And that was, that was amazing. That was so freeing to be like, oh, I see what you did. And I think that I could do it too. So when I wrote it, um, I wanted a story that had a heroine that looked like the people that I'd grown up with. I wanted something for my younger cousins, and I wanted to explore those similar stories, memory loss, reincarnation, true love, those, that emotional core of every story is there, you know, the bones are there, the culture and religion that informs the world building, I think is what makes it seem diverse, and it is diverse, but I'm not telling you anything new, you already know it, and so, and that was really the, the fun part about writing it. <laughs> we are not taking turns. I feel like it's it's odd. Um, so uh, a big thing that I wanted to do with my um, um, Y book is that I wanted it. I don't see very many Y books set in uh, San Francisco, period, or the Bay Area, and then specifically it's set in West Oakland. Um, I lived in Oakland for five years, and I was desperate to find books set in that area. It was very very hard for me. So I, uh, my main character is black, and he's also gay. And so he's dealing with a very, very specific issue. Um, you know, West Oakland's where the Black Panthers were born. So I wanted to have a book that not only addressed the political history of the United States, but then puts it in a very modern sense. Um, I, I also, uh, I guess a few things I went into it is that I, I didn't want to do the tokenism thing, because I'm just so tired of an entirely white cast with one of each of the other things, because that's not really how identities work. Many of us up here have multiple intersecting identities, and so I wanted to build 
a community that felt real, that was made up of people that, that seemed real. Um, and the other thing is that I, I had initially thought of this story as I wanted to do a story that addressed something I felt was left out of just the dystopian genre, yeah. which is that no one's, you know, I describe it as it's the divergent problem, which is that it's happening to 10 people in the middle of, of America, and they're all white. And that it seemed to me that in dystopian worlds, they never seem like worlds, they feel like a tiny little city. So I wanted to address the idea of, well, if a dystopian world were happening, who would it actually affect first? And usually, and if you look at history, it tends to be people who are in marginalized communities. So I wrote, I'm, I'm, this, my series is about a dystopian world forming, and it starts in one, one neighborhood in a city and spreads. And so that neighborhood, I wanted to build as realistically as possible. I, 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 there's actually a few people who've read the book. It's, I do this thing called uncanny realism. I want you to get to a point where you don't know when it's science fiction until I hit the switch. And so for a lot of people who've read it, they think the science fiction is a lot earlier, and it's not. Many of the things that are in it is research that I did to represent this community and to represent future, what seem like futuristic ideas, and they're not futuristic at all. They've existed for a long time. So um, those, those are, so it's not that I, I, I'm like diversifying the book, it's that I set it in a place where it would be specifically uh, addressing a culture and a group of people who don't often appear in, in YA, if that makes sense. Like, I didn't, I didn't write the characters and then be like, you're this race and you're this, like, Oprah, like I'm handing out. <laughs> but it was more that I deliberately set it in a place where, the where there is a vast majority of black characters and a vast majority of queer people because the Bay Area is such a hotbed for political activity. So I'm like, if I set it there, it's realistic off the bat that most people are not white and most people are not straight. So that there's not this idea of, oh, I'm just throwing it in there just to be diverse for the sake of it. <laughs> uh, well, I am currently working on a YA island set fantasy, um, and that's kind of like my love letter to all of my um, parents' adventure stories when they lived in the Philippines. Uh, my dad likes to call himself the like a jungle boy. And, <laughs> I don't know how true that is, but, <laughs> but it really informed my imagination. I wanted to always write something with that sort of tone and that adventure. Um, and when I started writing, I had um, I slipped in some inspirations from my own heritage. But when I was really revising it, um, I wanted to add in a lot more, and I realized that. I I didn't know that much about my own culture because when I was growing up, I lived in, um, I was one of like the only people who identify as a minority in my town, in my schools, all throughout my life. So that pressure to blend in and kind of reject what makes you different really had me very removed from my own culture. And so I owe a lot to this story because I feel like it's brought me a lot closer to my culture and to my parents because I always ask them about what their lives were like in the Philippines and how I can insert that into my manuscript and really pay tribute to um, my heritage. That is beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. It's, <laughs> that awesome. that would be beautiful. it's I mean it's it's hard because so one of the things that's also in my book is I've never read a YA book with a transracial adoptee in it, and I am. So my mom is white, my dad is Japanese white, um, and I'm Latino. My, my, my birth parents are El Salvadorian, Guatemalan, and so it's this weird experience in America where if you're separated from a culture, you have such a different experience than a lot of people who get to stay within it. And it's hard when you start to write, I, I have a character, Esperanza, whose, whose parents, she's adopted, her parents are white, and I start writing these things and I realize there's certain things about my own culture I don't know at all, and I thought I did, but when you're getting the details, you're like, this is me, and I don't even know what I'm doing, and, and it's cool when you have to do research on yourself, I guess, in, in a way, and it it's becomes this really transformative experience. I, I agree, um, that's something that I have to struggle with a lot, because like, I mean, I'm very obviously diverse, but my mother and my my single parent mother is white, like very very white. She has Elsa hair and blue eyes. So and I spent my elementary years living in this lake town where my best friend lived in a mansion with like a boat in the background. So that's how I sort of like learned my social cues. And then my mother moved me to a more diverse town and. Because the looked like me at school did not mm -hmm. did not 
We did not get along. <laughs> and it wasn't the, like I was trying to be separate. It was just that I felt so other because it's it's sort of like the whole white is default problem that we have in books. That's that can be a problem in real life too. I mean, I was raised by a white parent, and she raised me really well. But I'm not that connected to my culture, and that's something I've had to really work on in the past few years, especially because being so disconnected from my culture brought up some racial issues with friends that I didn't know how to handle because I'd always let that sort of stuff like slide under the rug. Yeah. So, um, that's like a really good YA novel, by the way. I mean, you said it to me first, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, it's all so good when you're like, I love it. <laughs> I mean, but I mean, the whole white is a default. Thing. It's funny because you bring, you bring up Rue when you brought up Rue and Thresh, and how so many people read that. Where if you read it, there are amazing context clues that tell us that they're not white. But so many people are used to the idea that everyone in um, in a, a work of fiction is white that they don't they completely miss them. Um, uh, a lot of people, if, if you've ever played that video game Portal, um, Chell, people think Chell is white. She's not at all. Um, and it's one of those things where even in video games where you can be anything you want in the world, people's default goes right to one thing. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a... It's usually the first color to that shows up. Skin tone when I choose my avatar. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it is. Yeah. I, I play a lot of games. It's yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> and there, I mean, even there's, there, I can't remember the name, there's that new game coming out, um, the one about the, the hackers. You can hack different things in the... In, wow. Is it, it's called Watch Dogs, I think? Is it Watch Dogs? Yeah. I don't know, but there's the second one coming out, and they made the main character black, and well, people, people are said, flipping out. Yeah, because, gamers did. yeah, they can't choose to be white for once, and they're, and they're like, but this isn't fair. I don't want to play as someone I don't identify with, and I'm like, I wonder what that experience is like. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, the whole white is a deep lovely. How much time did we have? <laughs> yeah, we could go on that for quite a while, couldn't we? Um, so, but the, like, it's not just race that's the problem with the lack of diversity in books, that we also had an issue of um, lack of different sexualities. Um, and disability and also class. That's something that's yeah. like really a really struggle I really struggle with because I've been carrying my camera around to film every panel that I go to. Not because I'm like trying to gain off of everybody's expertise, but because I think it's important that since I paid so much money to come here, I should document what I see for people who couldn't afford the same privilege. Right. Because I I I really love watching panels online of, of places I can get to go to and it helps me be a better writer. You're so generous. <laughs> <laughs> it's so thoughtful. It's 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 it, it's something that I'd like to see more in books because I am very poor. My family lives on less than sixteen hundred dollars a month and we're a family of four. And I spent almost that much coming here. This is the most expensive thing I've ever done for myself. And I'm trying to enjoy it, but I also, I'm also walking around like, how do I make this worth yeah. what I put into it? Because um, I have spending money, and I'm trying to think, should I buy books, or should I save it to help my mom with moving costs? Yeah. Because we also have to move at the end of this month, because the place we're living in doesn't want to do um, to rent through state-assisted living anymore. Um, but the problem is that it's not just people with state-assisted living that are having problems finding places to rent, because right now my state is in a uh, buying market. The mortgages are like 3%, so nobody can rent. And by the end of this month, I might be homeless. So it's sort of jarring to be here, and you want to see that in books. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, 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 want, I want people that I can connect with, but I also do want to escape. I don't always want to read about terrible lives that are very similar to mine. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. um, has that ever been like a factor in um, in creating diversity for you to like escape things that you're struggling um, from in daily life? Do you mind if I jump in in that yeah. kind of uh, agent point of view? So I love that you brought up uh, homelessness because I remember having Clive working on a book that featured a homeless teen and having a lot of trouble 
um, with editors telling me this is just not accessible to the market. People don't want to read about homeless teens because most of the time they can't relate to that. And I was like, but this is true for a lot of people. And we actually ended up having to shelve that book. That was before you know, this great, wonderful movement for diversity. That was like several years ago. Um, but I love that you brought that up because um, for me, I was also thinking like, well, even if these, you know, the teens who could relate to this book can't buy this book, this is why libraries are so freaking important. Yes. Those are how you get the books. Um, so I just kind of wanted to jump in like there. Like the industry has changed a lot, but we definitely saw, you know, like a lot of struggle from the beginning, and we still quite are. No, we're 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 definitely progressing, but we're not quite there yet. Um, but that's that is a real struggle that I see on the business side. I do feel like, I mean, I'm, I'm in a different position than you, and I wonder how the industry actually is I actually reacting. Have, yeah, I think we definitely have had a major change uh, point of view, especially with so many great grassroots organizations and campaigns. Uh, I think people are just so more aware of it, and editors are actually willing to fight for it more now. Mm -hmm. uh, I think because they always, they needed that kind of like that audience to say, we want it. Because it's really hard when you love, like even with books that are, books are hard to sell no matter what. So you already have so much stacked up against you. It's hard when you have to face the sales team and the marketing team, and they tell you, you know, like great cause, great message, but we, yeah, we yeah. can't because we don't think enough people will buy it. But the fact that people now, readers now, are saying we're gonna buy it, that that means a lot. So all the support, um, you know, that you guys do, panels like this, even though you know we should, like, eventually, I hope we reach a point where we don't need diversity yeah. panels anymore. <laughs> that every panel is a diversity <laughs> panel in itself. <laughs> Um, the fact that we are doing this and that we're kind of like shining a spotlight on it does affect the business. And I've seen it like from my, you know, from my experience working and pitching books throughout these years, it's become easier to pitch diverse books now because people want it. Or at least they're, I guess everyone has wanted it before, but now they're saying so. Yeah. Um, this is a question to the creators. Yeah. Um, researching you. I mean, I already know all about you. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, I, was, I was trying to polish myself up, and I, I noticed recently you mentioned at a signing that you took a diversity workshop before writing your yes. book, and I was wondering what, what you did I learn. Yeah, what you learned. It was that. really helpful, because, I mean, as mentioned, I love to learn, and um, I you know, I don't have, I mean, I didn't see myself necessarily in books because they're usually male, but I started to see more and more Lloyd Alexander was the first yeah. for me too. Yeah. Um, but I don't have the problem that you guys have, I'll be honest, you know, and I, I, it's really good for me to hear that. Because um, it's easy to be out of touch when you're not in that situation. You can be completely out of touch. You can see the pushback against the first books. People get mad because they're, it's new. Yeah. Um, and they don't like being told they're wrong. And. Uh, that's one of the great things about writing diversity when you're not in that situation is that you need to be open to being wrong. Like, I want you guys, to, like, it'll suck, but I want to know that I did it wrong so I can do it right next time. Um, so I took a work diversity workshop. It was, um, it was just really, I don't know, I guess one of the first things they talked about was like, we need to get rid of the stupid notion of colorblindness. That's crap, throw that out. Um, and, you know, acknowledge one another character, when, acknowledge the sort of physical identity of every single character. Don't just say, don't d default to white and then not describe them and assume readers will know they're white. Like, describe them. Yeah. And no matter what. And, um, which was really helpful for me because I am trying to build this diverse cast in True Switch and, um, and not just like pick and choose and do my year one, year one, year one. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, so that was kind of what I learned, and um, to just be, to ask, too, you know, like how, like one of the questions I actually wanted to ask you guys was like, um, as, you know, people of color, people with diverse backgrounds, how do you- Don't I know that! Don't that. Don't that. Don't <laughs> that was a dumb reaction. I'm sure you knew that, but it's just like, oh, wow. No, but I, I just, Uh, there's an awesome Tumblr, and I want to say it's called Writing in Color. Yeah. Writers in oh, Color. Yeah. Writing, yeah. Yeah. Writing in Color. Oh my yes. God. Bless them so much. But that, I mean, that's a common thing because it's like, well, if you want to describe the characters, how do I do it in what? The thing is, it's like, it is I tell people that you should be treating your descriptions of characters like you treat descriptions of other things. It's when you do that weird, extraneous, 
bizarre element of it, where you're like, his smooth almond milk skin, like, it's like, are you calling, are you calling buildings or hills with food colors? Why are you using food to describe oh, people then, yeah. you know? And so, um, I was at a convention last week uh, in Minneapolis, or more or less Minneapolis, and I was on a panel about how to write, specifically how to write diverse characters. And so the example that I'm just going to quote myself, I don't, it's so arrogant, but whatever, <laughs> is that, you know, and I'm sure you know this writing fantasy, is that oftentimes people will spend so much time developing entirely fictional creatures or locations. But not the cultures. But not the cultures. That was and one it's thing so, I really, yes, we can discuss that. Yes. <laughs> so, it's not a question. So yes. I, I get this a lot when I, when I teach workshops or I do lectures, is, is people are like, well, I don't understand why I should care about these things. And, I'm, and so I, I specifically use dragons because of a workshop I did where this guy just didn't understand it. And he had dragons in his universe, but he said it in this weird version of Japan where he did that thing where he decided that if, since it's Japan, I can just borrow from all the Asian cultures and just, you know, because Asian American means all of them are exactly the same. So, I mean, it was, it, it was a mixing pot of awfulness. And so I was like, why is it that you decided to have this Japanese culture, but this one is Korean, but this one's South Indian, and why are all of these things in here? And he's like, well, I'm just trying to build an exotic locale. And I'm like, okay, all right. But you have dragons in your book. I'm like, he's like, yeah. And I'm like, how much research did you do for dragons? And he was like, you know, I looked up, I read a bunch of different books uh, uh, in, in the genre where they have uh, dragons in them. I did a bunch of uh, research on reptiles and how reptiles would look if they, dragons were real, what would their skin look like, and what would their scales be like, and he goes all in detail, and I'm sitting there letting him embarrass himself in front of the audience, because he's going in so much depth, like, I know this, and I was like, sir, if you can describe the 233rd scale of that dragon, but you can't do the same for the person of color standing next to it, that is your problem. You are viewing these two things in completely different levels, and, and that's the issue, is that, is that we just want to be seen at the same level as, as the other characters. It's not that you need to go out of your way to, to describe us in like extreme depth. It's like, well, we just want the same story. We want to be the people writing the dragon. I mean, I really want to write a dragon. Be great, but, you know, we want to be the heroes. It doesn't need to be about race. It doesn't need to be about being poor. Right. Those can be elements. I just want to be the hero who, you know, Roasts a bunch of slave owners in Game of Thrones. Like I just want that, I want that to be me. Can you know? I actually like ask another question then? Because um, Janella, sorry to call you out. We were talking about this at lunch. The like the the, the line of cultural appropriation um, and how to walk that and how to know when you're going too far. And I would love to hear what you all think because we were really you know sort of discussing like what does it make it, when does it cross, how do we know. This year with your, sorry, I'm calling you back. <laughs> so, um, I already mentioned how I felt very removed from my culture just due to my upbringing and my surroundings. And so when I made the decision to you know, really put more um, of Filipino influences in my um, most recent draft of my book, I had like this moment of panic thinking, oh my gosh, did I do it wrong? Is it wrong for me to, like, is it considered cherry picking? Um, like just a lot of panic moments and it's funny because like it's good to be really aware but even though I am, you know, I'm very conscientious about including more of my culture so it was kind of like a vicious cycle I was having with myself of was I doing it right, how should I do it? Um, and I wasn't really sure if it could technically be called cultural appropriation because I am a person of that It's a lot of conflict. Yeah, but yeah. now we want to know what everyone thinks. So we'd love to hear it. Yeah, no, I'm not. Who wants to? Yeah. <laughs> um, I still think they think. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I, I completely understand the struggle with that because I felt the same way too when I was writing Star Touch Queen. I think that Hindu mythology itself is so layered and so deep, but also India is huge. Mm -hmm. One goddess worshipped in one place is not, you're not going to find the equivalent, maybe in a different part of India. And somebody is always going to be a little mad. That's just how it is. And I think that when it comes to having a culture inform your world building, so much of what you as the author knows is probably not going to make it on the page because nobody wants those info dumps. But I think it is really obvious to a reader when you know. 
because you make those small logical you, you make those small logical leaps in your head when you're writing it. And that just having done the research, even if it doesn't immediately manifest on the page, and even if you know the entire history of a monkey kingdom, but <laughs> and, but you only like offhandedly mention it or something, I think it it feels true to a reader because you are conscientious of it as you're writing. It's like the tip of the iceberg, you know? Um, and for me, when I read books that I think of cultural appropriation, it's because you're using a culture as an ornament mm -hmm. and as a side dressing, you know? And I get it that there are beautiful colors and we've got great food. <laughs> and our people are frankly like pretty hot. But, um, <laughs> blessed, but, <laughs> but uh, we're not all part of a harem. And we're not all part of a harem. <laughs> we'll be fine, but we're not. Um, and it becomes obvious, I think, to a reader. Um, when you only know something on the surface level. So I think that the best way to avoid that is to really push yourself to ask why. Why do you need this there? Um, and why do you need to have the world look a certain way? Why does somebody dress a certain way? And even if those details never make it, the fact that you know it, I promise you, is going to make a world of a difference to a reader. That was awesome. That was a great idea. <laughs> that was really good. Dude, it was the really good. sugar rush. No. Yeah. <laughs> I, it was like steeping <laughs> in my blood when I said it. That's such a good answer, and I think a good way of revealing that is um, something I heard in the panel. I had to miss your same story before. I'm so bummed about it. Um, Don't pressure. <laughs> we'll, we'll, have to, we'll have to talk about retellings later. For sure. um, I was in the Fan Fiction Perfect panel, and they were talking about how they try to avoid cultural appropriation with sensitivity readers. And I think that's really important, even as a diverse person, to seek out other viewpoints, even from your own, um, yes. your, even from yourself. Like I mean, like I said, I don't really fit in with a lot of other people of my race, so I need to be more cautious about how my upbringing has colored my world view because you might not realize that the way you're writing is going to offend someone if, if you don't realize it's offensive. And somebody else might not be, like, I might not be the best reader for some person, but I might be the perfect reader for somebody else. So I think that's probably why it's difficult for people to write diversely if they don't socialize diversely. Because yes. they don't have anybody to talk to. But People are people are willing. To, they, people love helping you create. That's the thing. Writers love helping other writers. Yeah. So it's all you have to do is ask and make them friends. People are afraid of criticism so much that they don't even want to risk it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which but, like, why but the, reason, all? the reason the reason readers <laughs> well, or, or fans get upset is because they really want your book to be great. They really want to feel empowered by your book. They want to champion it. And if it hurts them, they can't do that. And they want you to be better. And I feel like, as writers, that's what we want. We want to be better. And it is scary. Re rejection is scary. Criticism hurts. But I ultimately feel that working on, your, on yourself, even if it is like a fundamental flaw that you're going to have to seriously change is worth it in the long run. And they, most people who are, they won't hold a grudge forever. If you apologize and you make steps to correct it, they will probably actually be like, this person is freaking us. <laughs> they um, listen to me. Yeah, I, I think, um, and I'm going to get real awkward here. This is great. Uh, if you want a great example of why cultural, or what cultural appropriation is and why it's harmful, we just have to look not very far at J.K. Rowling's lovely, lovely North American magic. <laughs> now, if you haven't read a lot of stuff, and here's the thing, I've actually read almost zero of the text. I've read all of the meta about it as well. Um, and part of it is just that I, I, I admit that I haven't been super interested in post-Deathly Hollows uh, canon that's been being released. Um, uh, but so, why that a lot of what she's been doing with the indigenous population in America is cultural appropriation is that it's that, I, I don't know who said it, but the surface level, the superficial, here's the, here's the a generalized idea of what indigenous life is like in America, and then I'm gonna create my own details from it. So she borrows actual gods from indigenous cultures, but then just makes them cute little house 
uh, mascots, which is not, you can't, that's, the, the example is like, would you make a, a magic society based on Christianity and make one of the house mascots Jesus? Like, <laughs> that just seems really offensive, so, um, I, I mean, I think for me, the thing that was the most egregious was the fact that she had boarding schools in, in the United States for oh, indigenous yeah. Yeah, and if you don't know this, boarding schools were used to assimilate yes. the indigenous culture to be white and Christian. After they were stolen from their parents. Yes, yeah. so and that alone, I'm like, you clearly didn't do your research at all, because you would have never said, these kids in boarding schools, like, so that's the line there, is where it's, I, she might be appreciating these cultures from afar, but she never bothers to get up close, and she never bothers to say, hey, what would this actually look like if I had done the research and examined how these communities interacted with, with white settlers. Um, a lot of it just came across as like, oh, we're happy the Europeans are here. And I'm like, spoiler alert. Why did I say that? <laughs> yeah, I would really like to ask a question that goes yeah, along with So I'm a professor and I teach people that are teachers. Or She's also teachers. fantastic. Yeah. So. I, we love each other. So that's <laughs> But I struggle all the time with teachers who have the best intentions and say, I want to bring diversity into my white classroom where there isn't any diversity through books. But then they don't know because they don't know who to ask what books, and they end up bringing in books that, in what I, of course, I'm so quiet. I'm like, you just accomplished the opposite of your objective. You just brought in the most stereotypic, um, you know, yes, it's got authenticity, but it's got the stereotypic authenticity. You didn't bring in a book with. So I'm just curious what advice you would give to educators. I know I've had Mark at my school, and he yells at everybody. It's awesome. <laughs> that's a great question, and we're we're getting close to closing. I think that's a great question to end on. What yeah. you would like um, to see people looking for when they're trying to champion diverse books, and what we would like to see um, coming up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just yell at everyone. No. Uh, <laughs> like Shadow Shapers? Shadow Shapers is a great book. I mean, there's specific recommendations, but I think what Kathy's touching on more is like, there is a systemic problem here, yes. which is that so many yes. educators and in academia, there's just a refusal to do, which is so weird, especially in academia, because you can't, I can't imagine anything more niche than academia. And then they just, there's a, here's a thing where they're like, I'm not gonna go into any detail. Um, Google is your best friend. And I say that not as a way to be condescending, but there are more resources than there ever have been available ever in our lifetimes about how to write diverse characters, what book recommendation lists, uh, things to do, things not to do, all of these things that are available for zero dollars on the internet. That being said, pay us, by the way. Pay, <laughs> pay us, buy our stuff, support diverse creators as well, hire us to work on your television shows, hire us to write your essay, your essays, like, so oh, I need another hour. Okay, <laughs> someone else talk. I was also gonna say, I mean, there's a lot of, well, I only speak English and do mythology stuff, but we've got some great comic books. And they were the stuff that I grew up reading. It's called the Amar Jiffer Gata comic books, and I'm not, you're nodding, because like that's the stuff that a lot of Indian American kids and first generation kids read that, because we didn't know our own stories. And they're written in English, they're really easy to understand, and there are its own problems, you know, the way that the women are all dressed or portrayed or something. But I think, Starting with something that just great idea. yeah that you just want to read that every kid would like reading and then it's it's great because it um, it's personal and I those stories are great and wonderful but it also I think would start a kid thinking about what something looks like because there's nothing more it, it's just a little annoying when somebody reads a diverse book and they're like I just found it weird like I mean you can find anything weird but why did you find it weird is it just because you didn't buy into the magic system. You just didn't, it didn't jive with you. But identifying why you buy something weird and just starting from an early age just to, to look at the weirdness and <laughs> see what you like or don't like about it, yeah. For comic books, I'm always. <laughs>
I think like you know the thing that I see, and I you know I, I see things a lot from the business point of view. So I apologize for that. I'm not a writer, so I, I can't speak from that point of view. But for me, you know, like in terms of like librarians and like the things they order for library, that's so important. Like when you're a librarian, you're the gateway to all these children discovering all these different perspectives. So I, I think sometimes a lot of librarians have well intentions, but they end up censoring a lot of things. And I think that's the problem why a lot of our, you know, like a lot of the school systems don't have great diverse books because you know, a li their librarian or their educators think a book might be too, you know, might be too much for the readership when maybe it's not. You know, sometimes kids do need to get out of their comfort zone. And sometimes it's not even getting out of their comfort zone. Some of these are realities for a lot of their, like, their pupils. Um, so I think that is something that uh, I think educators are starting to learn a bit more. I know at ALA and um, their YASLA um, yes. organization, we're, they're definitely you know, trying to talk about this a bit more. And I think that's kind of the gateway to kind of you know, make it so that in schools, it's integrated that you know diversity is a normal thing, and it's not like oh we have to be careful about this. Let's pick like a nice diversity book. Like what does that even mean? <laughs> it, it, it is. It is truly a gateway. It is really important to have those, those, just those rep that representation out there. I think like. It's, it already shows itself. My brother is in high school and he's bisexual and he has like no problem with that at school. It doesn't affect his social life in any way at all. And that would not have been the high school social current and like just five years ago. Mm -hmm. But it's a, it has a lot to do with representation of, of sexuality in the media. So it really does create change if people see that diverse people are people too, then they start treating them like people, wow. So um, that's pretty much all we have time for. But we, I had such a great time with you guys, and I'm really glad you all came.